They don't give me that power. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> calling the meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. Um, are there any adjustments that need to be made to the agenda? I have one. You have one, Owen? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to, and I've already checked with the superintendent, I'd like to add a request for um, memorializing um, Sandy Berry to the principal's report. Okay. Thank you. Is that a good place for it? I think that sounds like a great place for it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other additions to the agenda or anything we should move around? Okay. Right. Right. Rodney, sorry, I just saw you unmute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, on the agenda, do, do we have a few minutes so we can talk about the uh, athletic fields? Uh, policy. Um, uh, I think athletic fields. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we could add that to eight eight point five. Yeah, I don't think okay. it needs. I just don't know what the policy is. Somebody asked, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Let's just think. Okay. It's some information. <laughs> so we'll add that to eight point five. I'm hearing. And is Tammy on? I'm not seeing. So I don't know if Lisa's taking minutes tonight. Do you want, we're recording. I hope, let me say that. Are are Great, thank you, Tammy. I thought you Thanks. probably were. Thanks, okay. Tammy. All right. Uh, Lisa, um, so, just, yes. just so you're aware, Mindy Beth Pike is here you? with um, the Rudd principles. Is it here? Yeah, please. She's, I'm going to report. I bet she's sitting there waiting. Okay, so I didn't catch all of what you said. Oh, and Mindy Beth Pike is present. With the Rudd principles, you know, I know you usually like to have people that aren't showing to be introduced, but. Okay, thank She's you. Okay, great. All right, um, first we begin with public comment. Um, if someone who is a member of the public would like to share, um, please unmute. Or um, if you're visible, you could raise your hand. Um, if you've called in, you can use star six to unmute. Okay. I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. All right. There's another opportunity. All right. So next, we move to our agendas, or not ag or our um, minutes. We have minutes of September 15th, and then our special minutes um, from the retreat. So those all constitute a consent agenda. Um, if people want to make a motion and refer to them as a single item. I would entertain a motion to pass those minutes. So I'll make a motion that we pass the minutes from the regular meeting on September 15th, the retreat on September 18th, and the special meeting on September 18th. Okay. Second. Is there a second? No second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, I can't see everybody. Um, so just jump in if you have questions or any comments about those minutes. All right, all in favor of passing the consent agenda um, minutes from September 15th, as well as the minutes from the 18th, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the minutes are approved. <clears throat> now we have a moment for um, board comments. Um, 
think similar to Owen, he mentioned memorializing Sandy Berry. Um, those of you on the Royalton side of things, you might not be aware, but a longtime Whitcomb High School teacher, Sandy Berry, um, passed away two weeks ago. Um, there was a lot of love and support reflected on her from her former students on social media that I thought was really a lovely tribute to a human being who dedicated a lot of her life to our school. So I just wanted to note that. Not sure if there's any other board comment. Okay. Um, so that brings us to reports to the board and we'll begin with the superintendent's report. Uh, you guys have my report in hand. I'll add that um, you'll find out more on Monday. And if you have questions, there is an executive session on personnel later, but we were able to reach a tentative agreement with the teachers today. I've been in mediation all day. Um, and like I said, I can talk to you a little bit about that agreement in executive session. They need to still ratify it. Um, but that's really great news. So, um, and I know that uh, your membership will present it to the full board on Monday to talk to you about the specifics of that. Uh, so that's great news. And um, I, uh, I'll also add that, you know, we're in the thick of the budget season. I'm uh, pleased to announce that we passed our final budget for uh, 2021 on Saturday. Um, and FBUD, so we, we were able to get that final budget uh, across the finish line. So that was great news too on Saturday. And um, we're in the thick of uh, budgeting right now for the upcoming 21-22 school year. Uh, we're gonna, we'll talk to you about that tonight. Uh, this is a first draft for discussion only around what we're thinking about for the student support budget. Um, many of you received, uh, well, you all received information from me that uh, Mary Ellen Simmons will be leaving us at the end of the month. Um, I'll talk to you more specifically what the plan about the, uh, that is on Monday, but there's no plan in place right now to replace her this year. Um, that Charlie and Amy will pick up some of those responsibilities here in the central office. Um, we'll continue to use that as a cost savings measure as we look to offset the current deficit and um, I feel comfortable that we can do that based on the fact that we had used all of our SU in service time at the start of the year anyways. Um, and that Amy will continue to carry the torch forward with literacy. And um, we're currently right now mapping out what our strategic plan will be to address math as we move forward into next year. But that's going to be a large strategy in the upcoming uh, grant is how do we increase math intervention, professional development and math as we, you know, we we launched into literacy. We're two years into that. Now it's time to launch into that as well. So um, you'll continue to hear more about that work ahead for WRBSU. And um, I'll highlight that the principals are going to receive a um, professional development um, from Michaela Martin, uh, who I used to consult with uh, starting on Thursday, where they're then going to pull in student support um, team folks from across the SU into that training next. And then that training will go out to interventionists in the spring, including special educators. And then we will look into launching this idea of uh, training the trainers approach so that we continue this momentum with PD as we move forward. You know, I've learned throughout my time that the principals are really the catalyst to creating this comprehensive system of supports. So if the principals understand MTSS, believe in MTSS, can really demonstrate and model what it means to analyze data, to be responsive to intervention, to see themselves as social emotional interventionists themselves, and have those tools so that you can help coach folks um, when they're struggling as, as educators. That's where MTSS really takes hold. Um, the principal is the change agent in regards to that. So that's why we're starting with training the principals first in this regards. Uh, around what that comprehensive system is and what it isn't. Because um, I think at times there's misconceptions around it. So she's doing that work for us pro bono. I'm using about every pro bono I got this current year. Um, and they're probably gonna run out soon. I think my friends don't wanna answer the phone anymore when I call them. But um, 
I thought it was really important that we start that work. So that work's going to start with the administration on uh, Thursday. And um, we launched into um, full days, of course, um, this week um, at the elementary. Um, that was not as significant of change as it was for your middle and high school to go four days a week. Um, I haven't heard anything negative as of yet. The principals weren't blowing up my phone today, and I checked on the both of them yesterday. Uh, I got to say, teachers have been unbelievably flexible. They continue to step up to the plate. Your teachers are rock stars. I can't thank them enough. And, uh, you know, we're doing this right. You know, the good news is all the data shows these work in the, in the protocols and procedures we're following in schools work in regards to spread. Uh, you know, the contact tracers are not finding widespread uh, current within schools. Um, they're finding that it's happening outside of schools. And so that's the good news. Um, we're continuing to monitor that data. I don't want folks thinking that we're not, we are. I'm in constant contact with Shane, um, who is in contact with the nurses across the SU, and we continue to monitor that. There's gonna be uh, some information. I know there's a lot of folks uh, wondering what we're gonna do in regards to the um, holiday season. I'm gonna put some information out about what I'm thinking about that, and I'll share that with the SU board um, also next week. Um, to get feedback from the SU board, like I have throughout when we've made decisions. And um, I also continue to work hard on Virtual Learning Academy to try to improve instruction there. A lot of information has been going out to those families. A survey went out today to find out what's working, what isn't, so we can continue to improve. We have a Virtual Learning Academy uh, informational night um, and kind of, you know, forum to gather feedback from folks and to address concerns based on what we get back from the survey. And I also have Lindy Stetson here tonight if folks have any questions about the Virtual Learning Academy. The good news is we got our final um, hire in place for that last week um, that's specializing in math. I think that's going to help. Um, and it's a retired teacher from Bethel um, who does great work, and she's coming in to, to service our elementary students in the VLA and math in, in several grades to make certain that the caseloads were appropriate for our teachers. So I finally feel like we're appropriately staffed across the VLA, um, which was more challenging than I would have thought uh, since we started back in August. Do you have any other questions? I'll entertain them. Anyone have questions for Jamie? This is Chris. Uh, I guess is that has that most recent hire have they started? I know, like I think our kids' teacher mentioned somebody starting soon, but uh, yeah, Mindy, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So Chris, she really wanted to make sure her name's Deb Scott. Um, and she really wanted to make sure she was comfortable with the technology. She didn't want to just leap in. So she's been doing a lot of shadow days where she's sitting in and watching what's working, what's not, and then working with people to get the technical support so it can be a much smoother transition. You know, hindsight 2020, just even the feedback since we last met about making sure people had the right technology training to make this successful. So you'll see her again tomorrow sitting in and even starting to take over some of the instruction. And then uh, we actually had a four or five virtual academy team meeting this afternoon to talk about the communication that's going out to families, including small group work blocks to make sure kids are getting assistance during that independent work time. So it's not parents scrambling, try to, trying to help find assignments and things like that. And then that way they can ask questions and it's more effective. So she will take over fifth grade math starting Monday, but she really voiced that she wanted to be able to shadow and learn and get everything set up correctly before jumping right in. Okay. Is she just doing fifth grade math or is she doing... Uh, she's also doing second and third grade math. This will allow us to continue with small group book clubs and or small group guided reading for teachers based on the numbers and really keep instruction um, just like it would be if we were in person in terms of numbers and things like that. The other thing that I've done is assign Amy Toth, who is our literacy um, coach across the SU. 
to v the VLA as well to make certain that she's continuing to keep up with coaching of teachers in that mode and not just in person. <clears throat> What's been the uh, what's been the, the comments from the parents that have kids in that uh, virtual academy? Positive. It's been a wide array, um, and um, you know the survey went out today to families. Um, so I'm excited to look at that feedback. I've worked with several different families, so I know individual concerns and I know uh, also successes and things that have really worked. We've received great feedback from our first grade instructor. So, um, and from parents about that, we've also received, you know, too much computer time, screen time. So it's all over the map right now, but again, it's, I have not heard from every family specifically. So I'm hopeful that this will give me some more uh, information to build on and continue to tweak to make sure we're getting that right. I think, it's, I think part of it, Bob's tough. Some people want to do homeschool, but with our materials, right? And then there's other people that want school to look a lot like it does day to day. And so I think that's part of what Lindy's been challenged with. Like I hear some people that they'll come to me and say, you guys are making it look too much like school. And then I have people that say, I want it to really look like school. You know what I mean? Like I want my kids busy eight to three. And so I think it's trying to find that like happy sweet spot where folks can push themselves if they want it to look more like regular school. But we also provide options where it can be more self-guided if it needs to be. You know, it's more personalized. And I think based on the feedback we get from the survey, that's what I'm going to be looking for the DLA teachers to do is to take that feedback and say, how do you differentiate to meet both those, you know, options or what folks want? Because the feedback's very varying based on what I hear around what some people are happy with and what some people are not. What's your, what's your gut tell you, Lindy? My gut tells me we could always do it better is the honest answer. Um, I think there's amazing successes and people have really put a lot of time and thought into this. And, but there's, there's areas we still need to improve on. I'm hearing a lot of like uh, screen fatigue is the word I would use in the um, teachers who are on all day are really trying to keep the pace up just like we're in person. And that's not necessarily as successful. Uh, because it's it's draining and they're not giving the right feedback and things like that. So um, I'm also seeing great small groups and really enjoying watching kids build relationships across buildings, which is something um, that at the beginning, it was like eight different schools in one melting pot and the heat wasn't turned on yet. And we were just trying to make it work. And now you're really seeing it start to come together and kids build relationships and asking to be able to be partnered up with different kids or in different kids reading groups that they wouldn't normally get to meet. Andrew and Chris have kids in that virtual learning. How do you feel? Well, I've certainly seen some improvements, um, you know, They've definitely been working on things and and listening to feedback and stuff. So I think that's I, I would agree. I think there's still some ways to go. Um, but I think they are doing a good job of of listening and adapting things. And I'm looking forward to seeing what things look like now that they have another staff member to play with. So yeah. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how it is with the extra teacher on uh, and being able to help free up at least you know from the four or five perspective free up the uh the current teacher for um uh, for all the kids uh um so i mean there's still yeah there's still things that could be better uh, you know i think one thing uh you know it still mainly focuses on reading and social studies and math uh are the the main topics uh you know even you know if if we could still you know work in some of the other things like we've uh i think i think andrew and i both mentioned uh i know kate lucia is maybe doing some stuff to uh with kids but you know even i know like last year 
in the when when everybody was remote. I know like for PE, it was sort of like you know they would get like a little choice board thing where it was for each day, you know, go outside and you know run laps or do this many jumping jacks or see how much of this you can do or that you can do. I mean, I think, you know, if, even if it's stuff like that, even if it's not, you know, necessarily face to face with a, a teacher, uh, but maybe if it's coming from a teacher and, you know, just giving them some more things to do that aren't on the, on the screen where they can step away. I mean, like the breaks are, are good that they have between the classes, uh, you know, to have some downtime to either work on an assignment or something, but, but then there's, uh, you know, but there's some other time that I think could be made use of use of too. So if there's, you know, things like that, that can help, you know, enrich the day a little bit more, I think that would be good. Lindy, is there any art being done over virtual learning? Um, there is a art teacher who is like half a day virtual. So she's been working with six, seven and eight virtually. Um, my thought is not as many, especially now that elementary schools are back to full day that ties up some of our essentials teachers. And one thought that Andrew and I had talked about at one point was building like a hub, kind of like what Chris is talking about, where they would be able to at least access different activities and then be off the screen and go independent. And then that teacher, you know, if we could get each, and I'm going to throw this out to our elementary principals meeting on Thursday, if each essentials teacher in the SU put together a unit, say, of things that they're already doing that, that worked well, that are really clear directions, and we could build that so every kid has access to it. And it's not necessarily a Google Meet with a teacher, but it's an opportunity for some of those other things that are really important to kids, like music class, like art class, like PE. I will say yeah. the regular teachers are also, they do build in drawing into, like they'll do reading and then draw something about what they read. And so they do mix in art into the regular instruction kind of some. Is there an elementary art teacher? For Virtual Learning Academy, there is not, no. But is there one in the regular class? You mean in person? Yes. That person doesn't do any art with the kids? Virtual learning kids? They have a full schedule. Right. So currently, that's the problem. All of our in-person instructors have full schedules. I was wondering how are is it? Are you feeling like the with the virtual learning that all of the students are engaging, or are you? It, are there some silent ones that you're trying to stimulate, and how are you? How are you doing that? Um, so you probably just described my week in a nutshell, Lisa. Um, we've really worked with building level connections. So that's, um, been the spot. Some kids, I, I know the name or have relationships with, but some people it's, uh, sometimes a cold call when you're like, some families are like, who is Lindy and why are they calling my house right now? Cause they haven't engaged. So we've been working with building level supports from MTSS coordinators to Owen and Andra to just different people to connect with those families. And we've had a lot of team meetings about what's working, what's not working. How do we get your student engaged? Um, I would say it's all a flurry of middle school activity for some kids who are showing up, but not necessarily hitting the submit button. So teachers weren't able to provide feedback and, um, the old send the Friday email, so we see a difference on Monday, made a world of difference for those handful of kids. Uh, so it just depends on the kid is the simple answer, but I've spent a lot of time coordinating with a wide range of special educators, building level principals, you know, 504 coordinators about what worked in the spring to make sure these kids were connected and engaged to, um, okay, we need to pull the families in, this has been long enough, and we're concerned, you know? We, need to account for every kid and make sure that they're doing well. Thank you. You're welcome. Lisa? And like you said, you know, at the end, what we're doing is if we, if it's really not working, then we're recommending that families look to go back in person. 
unless there's an underlying health issue or why they're not in person. Oh, and go for it. Um, I want to um, praise Lindy because we all do hard work, but what she's doing is amazing. And she's always accessible. She's super responsive. She's funny, by the way. And she works really hard at what she's doing. And you may not know this, but it's October, which is National Principals Month. Thank you for the fruit basket, by the way. And I think honoring Lindy in this moment is a good thing. I mean, she's amazing. This is like representative of the pandemic, of people stepping up. And really, really great job, Lindy. Congratulations. Thank you for the kind words. And there's a rock star um, virtual academy teacher on. I don't, she flashed for a second, but Tracy Gardner has been leading our first grade. And I just really want to give her a round of applause because she's done an awesome job. And if there's someone else here that I'm missing that I can't see because you're on a phone number, <laughs> I apologize. But Tracy has been doing an awesome job, as have they all. You know, maybe this should be part of our agenda every month is just recognizing you know, the big, the and tremendous effort that people are, I mean, obviously everybody's been doing amazing work, but I think it's nice to recognize, get spe special recognition. I think we're all needing that, but. I can tell you that Jamie does that with the administrators. That's how he starts oh, our great. meetings. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you all for that. Um, I'm wondering if anyone else has other questions for Jamie. Well, that probably was Jamie and the VLA, but I could be wrong. But. OK. <laughs> or Virtual Learning Academy. We we pivoted. OK. So that brings us to our um, more traditional principles report, which you should have received in a packet from Christy. Um, can I start on that? As far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, building on the principles of the month thing, or the, the principal month. And, you know, I, I love my job. I really do. And I've, I've really enjoyed helping set up the safe way of being outside and really exploring that. We may have ruined school for some kids, by the way. But, and also, it will get cold and they'll love the building. <laughs> but I also want to um, highlight Andra and Reed as my colleagues. And I'm not just blowing, you know, air here. I, they're awesome. And I don't need anybody to say anything nice about me. I know it's hard. But they're really, and Andra's doing two schools, making them one school. And managing teenagers in a pandemic with phones in their possession. God bless you, Reed. Or if you need a mental health line, I got one for you. But just to set up our, our presentation here, you did get our report, and uh, we organized it the way you said it's supposed to be with, like, the three big goals. And, you know, in, in um, layman's language, it's like, you know, social-emotional, making sure that MPSS is the centerpiece of what we do for the tiered systems of support. Connecting with the community, and that includes family, students, and, and larger community. And what's the other one? The literacy one? Proficiency-based learning. Literacy uh, Proficiency-based yeah. learning, yes. And we've outlined what we've done, and some of it's carryover because, you know, we're working on some stuff. But there's some really cool stuff in there. And I know you're busy and you read a lot of stuff, but... There's some good stuff happening, and we should be pretty proud of it. You're going to see some gems really grow. Now, we're going to pivot to um, turning. I don't want to take all of uh, Andrew and Reed's time here, but uh, and we brought Mindy Beth with us on purpose. So, but Andrew, do you want to start with the elementary? Should we go up uh, chronologically? Um. So. 
specifically to the principal's report or do you want to transition to the data? Is that what you're saying? I was thinking, yeah, unless you and Reed want to add something, go to our data because that's our focus to, on this meeting. Yeah, well, the, so I... The data is on the agenda lower down after... Yeah, it's report. on H.1. Oh, okay. So let's just talk, talk about the elementary schools, I guess. I think the big highlight is we wrapped up the assessments. Um, then the other big highlight is that we transitioned to more of a regular full day, um, which we were going all day. It just looks like specials are happening and not just afternoon enrichment block. So um, I think right now the, the data, data, potato, potato, uh, crunch is where we're at. And um, now looking at um, any of the slide that we had and trying to assess who needs um, some tier two supports and how we're going to wrap around our kids to move them forward between now and the next testing phase in, in December. So we'll talk a little more about that. But for me, as far as elementary, everyone still seems happy. Everyone still seems good. Teacher are working, teachers are working double time and I'm really appreciating all their efforts. Um, and, and that's my takeaway for what's going on right now in the elementaries. And at the middle level, we we're at four days. We started that on Monday, yesterday, and we had to check, if you will, twice as many people we had to do a health screening for. We had to feed twice as many. It was all came together. Again, pandemic magic. You know, we see a lot of like horrible things happening in the pandemic, including 200,000 deaths. But there's some real magic that people like, teachers know what to do. And, and you know, I've also, point out like on the Bethel campus, Sandy Tracy, who's on our MTSS team has really carried the flag for keeping people safe in the parking lot in the morning with temp checks and everything. And she deserves some praise too. Middle school's in four days. I'll let you know, this is, we only had day, day two. So um, maybe next board meeting, we'll have more information for you, but two days, we'll take the honeymoon. Reed? Uh, to, to kind of follow up on that, the high school has been back so all our classes uh, have met at their full size. We're using uh, the two gyms and the library for our larger classes so that students can be six feet apart. Um, I, I think universally, we would say it's been very impressive how our adolescents have stepped up to wearing masks mm. and physical distancing. I know administrators were worried about this all summer and how are we gonna enforce this? Uh, and uh, you know, kids wanna see their friends and hug after they haven't seen him in a long time. And, and that's been a little bit of a, a thing that we're working against, uh, but otherwise they're, they're really doing a good job and uh, we've come back four days and I feel good about it and confident we can do it safely. So um, with, with that said, there are a lot of exciting new initiatives uh, at the high school. One of them being work on an alternative program uh, for the high school for next year, which you'll see evidence of as we we talked through the student support budget coming up in just a little bit. Uh, and the other is some work we've been doing with personalized pathways. Uh, so we've started to work with a couple of individual students, creating some really unique programming for them uh, that really gets out of sight of the box of how we used to do things. Um, and so we're piloting that and hoping to grow that. Again, you'll see some evidence of our plans when we look at the student support uh, plan for next year. Um, Finally, one, one thing that you're going to want to know about, uh, although I don't have a lot of details to tell you, uh, is that our HVAC univents, 16 of these big eight foot long uh, floor units that bring outside air in and mix it with inside air and filter it for viruses, uh, they are, yet we believe they'll arrive the first week of November. Uh, we don't have a hard date. They're not on a truck yet. Uh, so we are trying to plan for that. Um, and continue to learn more about what that entails. Um, the first piece of that is that we need to have electrical work in so that all of those classroom units will hook into our master computer so we can program the temperature and airflow in any of those rooms uh, remotely via computer software, which is pretty cool. Um, but that work should start with the electrician tomorrow. Uh, he wanted an initial down payment for some of the equipment he'd need. Uh, but we talked him into getting started so that the electrical piece wouldn't slow this project down. Uh, what we've learned is that you can't shut the heat off or the water off for one unit without shutting 
the heat off for the entire wing of the building. So we are confronted with the challenge of not having any heat in the elementary wing for approximately five days, uh, the five days we think it will take to do this. Um, and then we will have the same situation in the high school wing, uh, which is on a different heating zone, but we'll lose heat in the high school for about a week in order to install seven units. Um, we meet with the vendor tomorrow morning uh, where we're gonna hash through some of these details uh, I think the, the criteria are we want to make sure families have at least two weeks notice in advance of this happening so they can plan around it, uh, which which puts us pretty close to uh, the arrival time and tomorrow's meeting with the vendor. Um, I, I think the other thing is we're looking at, you know, can they use Thanksgiving week and we push this back a little bit if they do show up uh, as scheduled on November 4th. Uh, or do we want to be remote the first week in December? Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna look at what the options are as far as their staffing for making this happen and what dates are available for doing this work. Uh, and once we know, we'll get that word out to families and all of you. A reminder: this is all covered by the grant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so th this is what like one hundred eighty thousand dollars of Univents. Uh, about a week ago, we got a set close to $7,000 hospital grade HEPA filter that's now working in the nurse's office. Uh, it's a little bit loud for the small space, but uh, you can almost feel the improvement in the air quality there, which adds a real feeling of security for folks who are coming in there with sick people in and out of that office. Um, so things are moving along. Reed, are they going to install any valves with those unit vents so that in the future when any work needs to be done, it won't cause the shutdown of a whole wing? Uh, I'm guessing that, you know, for the piping and stuff, that it's likely because there's not shut off valves at the individual units. Uh, you know, unless the piping system is such that it's, I'm just teaching my students about this in class last week, what we call a series loop. Uh, where the piping goes directly from one unit to the next. And so when you shut off the water to one, you got to shut it off to all. But I'm guessing that it's probably just that there aren't isolation valves installed. And those are those parts are a couple bucks a piece. And if they're doing the install, you know, I don't think it should add much extra labor uh, if if they can do that. But, you know, but you would want to ask them about that and not like surprise them with it on the day of. But you know, we will negotiate them. valves. <laughs> yeah, yeah but that would be something to check on because, yeah, I mean, that's the one thing you don't want, you know, as we see right here, uh, is an interruption to your to your day and especially to the whole wing of a building, uh, you know. Yeah. You know, when, when these jobs go in, you know, on the front end, so like years ago, you know, it may have seemed like a good way to save some money and not put in those valves, but now we're learning why they need to be there. I don't know if that's what happened or not, but, you know, that's that's the usual thing. Right. Yep. I'll uh, I'll bring that up tomorrow. Uh, one one other thing. It's a little bit facilities related. I, Andrew's not as excited as I am about this. Uh, but yesterday, um, with our COVID grant money, we received the hot boxes for serving uh, what had been cold lunches are now arriving in student classrooms as hot lunches uh, that are humidity controlled, so they won't dry out. Uh, so I had some delicious USDA commodity beef meatloaf homemade by our line cook in South Royalton today with uh, some buttered peas and uh, brown rice. Delicious. Mm. I'm glad those finally arrived. Just to be clear, I'm really excited about the boxes. I was not helping with moving boxes. That was my, I drew the line. <laughs> They're big enough so you could use it as a sauna. That's true. <laughs> is, that I think, our, is that our overview of our report? And should we um, take questions at this? And yeah. unless yeah. You yeah. That. lunch is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for the work that you're doing. I appreciate it. I'd like to ask Reed a question. Yeah. Go ahead, sure. Bob. Okay. Are you are you uh, running an eight day an eight period day with your kids now? Uh, we we have eight classes, but they alternate A B A B. So we have 
they go through eight classes over Monday, Tuesday, and then the same eight classes in the same order Thursday, Friday. Um, with the, the desire to limit student exposure to one another, uh, especially in the hallways, what we're down to is there are only three passing periods in our day right now where kids move around the building versus if we had if we went with the schedule we had voted on last year there would be at least six transitions within the school day uh, so that would be more time out of class because we've we've lengthened passing periods so students can be six feet apart go into the bathroom one or two at a time uh, and maintain all those kind of safety protocols but once this is all cleared up, we're going to go to our modified schedule that'll have more classes uh, every day. Any other questions? All right. If that's all for the principal's report. Um, we'll move forward to, um, I think we already did virtual learning, so that will bring us to the business manager's report. I sent you all my report. I believe it was Friday. It's kind of blurred together at this point, so I'm just going to touch on a few of the highlights. Otherwise, I'll take any questions that you have. But as Reed was just explaining, we got the additional approvals for several of our buildings under the Efficiency Vermont grant, and I gave the totals on page two of my report of the breakdown throughout the FCU. So I just want to congratulate all the facilities teams and the administrators who worked with the contractors to get the scopes of work submitted to Efficiency Vermont and stuck with that to receive some of that grant funding. So that was a great team effort. The other big thing, um, when we get together, Jamie had emailed out about food service. So you all are aware that USDA extended the summer food service program. So that's good news for our families and our communities that children will continue to eat for free throughout the rest of the school year. And then on the full board agenda for Monday night, um, we are going to discuss the announced versus allowable tuition and what we are going to do as an SU. And also, um, we'll, I'll discuss with the policy committee how we are going to handle paying tuition um, or not paying tuition when we don't have residency verification. So as far as Red's concerned, that could potentially be tuition receivables for you as you don't actually tuition your kiddos out, but it does impact the rest of our member districts. Board stipends, if you sent me your W-4s, will be paid out October 30th. If you haven't gotten them to me, please get them to me ASAP so we can get it into payroll and they can get you set up as an employee. And then lastly, we are we were approached by two additional solar companies, Green Lantern and Stratford Energy. They would like the opportunity to review your electric bills and also provide a proposal similar to what Encore Renewable did. And Ray has agreed to partner with me to get that information together to present to you as I am not a solar expert in any way, shape or form and need the guidance of someone who knows more about it than I do. So stay tuned in the future for that as well. Jamie, did I miss anything? No. So if you have any questions. Thank you, Tara. Does anyone have questions for Tara at this time? I guess real quick, uh, what could you explain? I know you're going to talk about it more on Monday, but uh, just in terms of the words, what's the difference between announced and allowable tuition? Uh, so you don't need to get it. Chris, back in January, you had to set your announced tuition rate for the current school year. And then the Agency of Education compiles all of that information along with all of our expenditure reports. And by December 15th, they are supposed to, by statute, release the allowable tuition rate. And if we overcharged for a calculation, a formula that's 3% and it has a bunch of other factors in it, then we have to pay it back. Or if we undercharged, we can do additional billing. 
And we have to decide as a supervisory union, are we gonna do it or are we not? And we have to do it for everybody or we can't do it at all. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. I'm guessing that might be a harder sell in some of the other towns of their district or SUA. <laughs> That's correct. There has been some very substantial bills in other member districts as a result of when the agency releases, which the last two years have been later and later. Last year, we got them in the end of July, early August for the two prior fiscal years ago. So yeah, it's a, a lot of money for some of our member districts. Um, on the tuition front, the... Uh alternative school tuition rates seem like they jumped pretty significantly. Have you looked at what that's going to do to the SPED budget for whatever alternate placements we have currently? In our initial review, based on some of the kiddos who have gone to a different alternative placement or have come back into our supervisory union, we think we will be okay, but we will continue to monitor that as our additional tuition bills come in. A lot of our schools are late in issuing tuition bills based on COVID and figuring out who's here and who's where. So they're not, we don't have all of them in yet where normally we would have the majority of first semester tuition by now. So based on what we think we've got for kiddos and their placements that are staying in their placements that aren't going to homeschooling, when I talk to Tracy and Don, we should be okay. It is so, Andrew, why we're interested in building our own program at the high school level, because as you guys know, you pick up a huge chunk of special ed costs. And so even when we have students who choose not to come to Rudd, let's say they choose to go to Thetford Academy and the IEP team decides that they need an alternative placement, we are still the LEA. And so that means that cost is then billed back to us and so that IEP team, the, my goal would be that if they make that decision, you hear more about this Monday night, that if they say this student needs a specialized program or pathway, that we'd say that's fine, then that specialized program and pathway can be at Run High School and whatever mm -hmm. program that is. And it doesn't need to be in a separate program. You see what I'm saying? Because the LEA, you can make that decision about placement. Yeah. Uh I just wanted to, um, that all makes sense to me. I just wanted to chime in, and I'm sure this is already happening. A couple of years ago, um, we asked for information about students who were in alternative placements who were not on IEPs, um, and whether that's periodically, periodically being evaluated, whether their alternative placements are the best placements for them. Um, just the idea of bringing them back to our community when we can. Um, that was and in Don's report in one. August, and I'm sure he'll have it in his report again. Okay. Yeah. I just, um, I, I know that that's something we're working on. Thank you. Did you all? The alternative schools would include regular education. Yep. Kids. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think folks are, Bob asked if we were going to build alternative programming, would that be for all students? And I said, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I guess we might be talking about this when we get to the student support budget, but the alternate program, if you have somebody from one of the other sending towns that goes to another school, then recommends an alternate placement that then comes back here, how does that work for the funding? Like, do we just get a regular tuition or do we get an alternate placement tuition? Like, how does... How would that probably the best one to answer you that because he's built those programs within his prior district. Right. Uh, so I would ask that question Monday night, Andrew, because that budget, you're going to get the first glimpse of the SU budget Monday night, and that will have special ed in it. And he can answer all those questions. Okay. Yeah, I guess just like, are we, I, I guess when we get to the student support and talk about the alternate placement thing, it'd just be good to know whether that um, you know, is part of like when we have special education parts of it, is that part of our budget or is it part of the SU budget and how are we? All special ed's SU budget. And so nothing in here that you see tonight is special ed related. Okay. This is all your Good. budget. That, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. um, 
the final thing for Tara is just that these um, this report didn't make it into the folder with the rest of the reports to the board. Um, so you should put Christy on the email um, when you send your report, um, just for future months. I send it to Christy separately because some of my reports that I give to you are not public information. Okay. She, was, she received it under a separate email. But yeah, I will ask her to make sure that it. she gets it posted. Okay, good. All right. Um, thank you. That brings us to the finance committee. Um, yeah, so we met on Thursday. Uh, we usually do the first Thursday of every month, but we delayed it a couple weeks this time. Um, we reviewed the plowing contract um, and uh, talked about um, the cash flow and looked over the student support budget, which I think we'll be going over in a little bit, but it was a good meeting. I um, guess we can talk more about those things when they come up in the in the agenda. Thank you. Andrew, I'd like, I'd like to add something to that. Um, there was quite a lot of discussion about um, paying off some of the uh, uh, tax anticipation notes. And I, right. I think we all agreed that we should try to do that. Right. It sounded like we were maybe hold like rather than paying off the tan as much as we could, we were holding on to more cash than maybe we should. So I, I think it, that's something that comes up to the various treasurers. So. Um, I think Tara was going to talk with them about doing that kind of thing. Yes, once we got the October reconciliations done, so I knew what you have available for cash on hand, I will have a discussion with Pam to decide what we can, if any, pay off on your tax anticipation note. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that brings us to the policy committee. Um, feels like we haven't met in a long time, um, but we have these three drafts, um, which I believe we've read once so far. Is that correct? This is our second yeah, read. So the idea is that these will go to get adopted by the full board, and then you, my goal would be that you just yeah. adopt them. Like at that point, it's a rubber stamp for the local boards, the following mm -hmm. month, because you've all had a chance to. Yes. So it's just really important to make sure um, that you've reviewed them, and when we go to the full board meeting, um, that we haven't seen anything that those of us who are voting members of the full board. Um, could raise as concerning, or I guess I worded that incorrectly, I'm sorry. If you see something that's concerning or you think needs to be changed, um, it's really important for you to let me know or um, come to the full board meeting and share that information. So again, these are second draft at this point. And I think we were pretty okay with them last time. The policy committee was, yeah. You guys yeah. said, yep, you were good. I don't have yep. a copy of those. Somehow or another. Didn't I think there are hyperlinks, but oh, yep. maybe I did some click on I can go and see it. If they want if they're, if they're on a, a link, I can get They are on a link. I'll go here. I have them every meeting. <laughs> Yeah, and we won't be voting on them until Monday, so. I added it to 8.5. You have time to review them. Any questions about policies? Okay. Um, that brings us next to our academic data report. Hi there. So you got the data report earlier. I don't know if you want to project it at all or you want me just to talk. Um, I'd like it projected. Okay. 
Um, Lisa, are you going to do that or did you want me to? I think Secret Ray behind the scenes does it. Secret Ray behind the scenes is doing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the top portion of the report um, is comparing, it's a little lengthier, but it's looking at the three different program areas. It's comparing the data from fall of last year to the fall of this year. Um, and the real difference with it is that the reporting from this fall doesn't include any virtual academy students um, because not all of them finished it in time to run this report. So the data teams decided to just look at in-person student data and hopefully next time um, when we figure out all the kinks of virtual academy um, that will be able to be included into the report. Um, but if you scroll down to the second chart that's on here, it's a little bit more of a condensed version. Keep yeah, scrolling, so Ray. Scroll down Keep a little scrolling. more. Yeah. You're not there yet. Keep going. There you are. This one right here. Yep. So most of the students were able to maintain their reading levels. Um, since the fall of last year and during our closure. Um, where we see some dips is with math, um, starting around fourth, fifth grade and up into the middle school. Um, and then the high school really did a decent job maintaining their math and their growth was 10% for their literacy. So if we're looking at all this um, combined and thinking about some conclusions from it, um, everybody's really maintained their literacy. Um, the high school data shows that really great increase in the reading proficiency. Uh, the more concerning piece of data is the 81% of middle school students who are not proficient in math, um, which like I said before, really kind of starts to dip in the upper um, elementary school. So a couple things that we're planning on doing and things that we're thinking about um, is one, we've created data teams. So the data teams comprised of teachers, special educators, interventionists, and administrators. Um, and each program, we're gonna meet a couple of times a year together to talk about some things that we need to do together um, to make the administration of testing really successful. Um, but most of the time we'll be working in those elementary, middle and high school groups. So this time we reviewed the STAR 360 data for math and literacy. And we reviewed our one-on-one -on -one reading assessment that we do in the elementary school. And we tried to narrow down a specific skill in math and reading for each grade level or group of grades. Um, and we presented that to the teachers today in the middle school um, and the elementary school next week. And the idea is that the faculty can look at that standard or proficiency and say, okay, what instructional practices can I put in place in my classroom to boost this skill area for all students? Um, so that's one thing that we're working on. Some great work came out of today um, from the staff. There's some really great plans in place for how to improve those areas of literacy and math. Um, <clears throat> even though everybody sort of maintained we still have around the same number of students who are getting targeted intervention services. So it's about 75 students on our caseload right now, uh, both campuses K-8. Um, we've got four and a half interventionists this year. So it's three and a half in both elementaries and one full-time literacy support in the middle school. And um, some things that those interventionists are doing is um, pulling kids out individually or pulling kids out in small groups. Um, and then sometimes we also try to push into the classroom to give support or to participate in some sort of co-teaching model. Um, most of the kids' literacy needs are supported by our LLI program um, from Fontes and Pinnell. Uh, but other students do receive more targeted instruction, particularly with phonics. So. We might use a Wilson Language Program or Orton Gillingham Program. Um, because there's such a high need of literacy kids on our caseload, it's not leaving as much wiggle room for math support this year. Um, 
We had four and a half interventionists in the elementary last year, um, and it seemed like we were able to more manage pushing in and co-teaching into the math classrooms. Um, let's see, so for math, um, Bethel's still using Envision, but we're piloting the newest, latest, greatest version of it. And um, South Royalton is piloting an iReady math program. So we're hoping that with the consistency of math programs, K-5, that it will improve math scores because we're using this more consistent approach. Um, in the high school, I had said that literacy had increased and math maintained. However, um, it's, there's still 60% of the student population who's low in math. So we'd like to give some consideration to putting some academic support structures in place in the high school in the future. Um, and again, math's really a concern. Almost 50% of the kids are not proficient in math. So um, a couple of things we would like to consider is moving towards a full-time math interventionist, 5-8, um, because right now it's just a half-time person and it's a pretty big caseload um, for her to manage. And we're also thinking that the creation of a pre-K-12 math team to align curriculum, programming, and instruction could afford a really good consistent approach for our K-12 program and hopefully improve student um, proficiency in math. Any questions? And I just want to say that it's a lot, and I remember from our last meeting, I think it was Lisa McCorry, you asked for us to stop maybe with like so much of the jargon and, and um, abbreviations. So I tried to go through this and remove that and spell things out and put links in case it was something that like you say someone says Orton Gillingham and you're like, what is that? So um, there might be places for you to dig deeper into this report if, if you want to know more. Thank you for doing that. Lisa, I have a question. Great, go for it. Jamie, help. What do you think about the math program? Uh, Bob's question was what I think about the math program. So I think we didn't have a consistent approach at, at Royalton. Um, Bethel had been using this uh, same, say, what are you guys using in Vision? Yeah, so we spent all last year looking at our math programs with a, a team from both elementary schools um, and looking at a bunch of different math programs, went and visited schools, um, and we knew that we, we needed to get in one direction. Um, our team was divided at the end when we started talking about which math program to go with. And so in consultation with Jamie, we talked about piloting both these programs for this year, looking at the data and seeing how it's really working. Um, and then maybe with implications for the full greater district to move towards one, one pro math program so that we could just get more bang for our buck too when we're moving into professional development. Um, right now we have two different programs, one on South Royalton, one on South which I would say it's an improvement because even on the South Royal campus, there was multiple programs being used across grades. Three, three. It was three. <laughs> yeah. And, and I will say uh, measure that data and ensure that, you know, we're selecting a program that makes the most sense since they're coming to a unified middle school. Um, you know, but I would say any consistency is better than that. I love the idea of a K through 12 approach because math is so linear. And it's really important that we have measured milestones throughout the grades. Um, you know, I think an area that I would say that I'm concerned about in general is whether or not we're doing a good job of team building and ensuring that our foundational skills for UK. Now, I would just, I, I think that that's something that we can put a heavy emphasis on universally. You know, number of cents, place of value, um, and just making certain that folks have a good skill set at that K-1-2 level on those areas. Because I think what we're finding is, as you look at why students struggling in middle school, typically it's that those gaps started in K-1-2. So that's what we got to address. You know, those students struggling in middle school, I guarantee are still struggling with, you know, the idea that uh, groups of, they're still struggling with, uh, Double digit regrouping, it's foundational skill from K1, 2, 3. 
and then you get into fractional reasoning in four. You know? Are we are we looking at a program that builds on itself? I'm, I'm that's just, what they have. Both of those both those schools now have a program that builds on itself. Okay. And, and if you look at the report, I actually put links to both programs in there. So if you wanted to dive deeper into like the scope and sequence of the programs and the benefits of both of them, you could get more information there. I think the idea too is as we train our teachers up more, I would like to say the program is a tool. Right. And that our teachers have enough skill set to know what units to pull from the tool to supplement what they're doing, but that they feel confident enough in math that they know how to teach additive reasonings and the milestones through additive reasonings in grade one. I think that a lot of elementary teachers at times have math phobia, right? And so, you know, that's one of those things that we just get to, we get to beef up their confidence. Um, and so that's, in, that's why I said math has to be our next launching point of focus. I'm concerned. I don't know. I don't know what kind of math program you use. I don't know what it entails, but um, having looked at a lot of math programs, are we dealing with a math program that has lessons for, let's say, 170 days of math lessons? The teachers are, are every day teaching a math lesson that's been prepared for them by a program. There's... I agree with Jamie uh, on this. I, I think that we, I think that teachers, I believe in academic freedom, and I think that teachers, a math teacher or an elementary school teacher, has skills and should be able to should be able to understand what that student needs to know at, at certain levels, rather than a program that's set up with a lesson every single day that that teacher teaches and supposedly builds on itself. And my problem with that is we have teachers coming in and out of our schools, kids coming in and out of our schools that who knows what they've had for a math program. So I'm really, I, I'm really interested in this, and I'm, I'm curious as to know what we're trying to do. So. I'm not sure if you want me to respond to that or not, but I will no, say, I would love you to. Yeah. as we were looking, I think, um, from both campuses, given the pandemic, they were really interested in a math program that would uh, work well with going online. And I do think that a lot of our teachers absolutely have the skill set to, to do some of this backfilling like you're talking about and, and meeting kids right where they're at. And it was part of our conversation today at our staff meeting is, you know, a lot of kids, they're learning kind of stopped in March just because they weren't in school. And so they don't have those foundational skills to just jump right into maybe third grade math because they missed a whole bunch of second grade math. So. You know, that was part of our conversation about, you know, I know I'm supposed to be doing this, but I have to pause the lesson because I feel like there's gaps. And so we have to, to backfill. So um, it's not, I think, as straightforward as a 178 pages and you teach this lesson this day and this lesson this day and this lesson this day. They have um, there is a built in assessments and there's opportunities for, you know, if a kid has some gaps. These are options for you to to do some remediation with kiddos. There's also extension activities. Um, and what we all know about all programs is there's no perfect program. So I think what Jamie's saying is is really important that building up teacher skill sets about knowledge and literacy and math is really where it's at long term. But I think short term, given a pandemic and given that we have to do so much online, um, I think this is kind of alleviating some of the prep work they have to do to deliver math lessons, given if we have to go online. You know, I think, Bob, one of the next steps would be like, much like we kind of have an outline of what a literacy block should look like. My goal would be in the curriculum world that we have an outline of what a math block is going to look like, what a science block is going to look like. So the boat, you know, you teach within the structures of the, the instructional block, right? Like you have core components that you do and that you implement. And then you can use that as a tool to supplement what you do. Um, and so that's what we need to get to. Well, I, I don't want to go into this too much detail but my experience with examining math programs for instance i looked at a math program that had a lesson for kids 
sixth grade math program that had a lesson for kids every single day. And in that lesson, in those lessons, there were four days, four lessons of multiplication tables. I don't want that kind of program for our kids. So I agree. I feel really confident that the teachers really had a lot of ownership in, in picking the programs that they're piloting right now. And so I, I feel really confident that these programs that we're using are a step in the right direction, but not the end all be all. Based yeah, on now we're all yeah. using the same teacher language, which is important. You know, I think before kids were spending half the time trying to learn the program and not the the content. So at least now we have a common instructional language and approach. Step one. So this is Chris. Uh, I guess I got a couple of questions. I guess I guess one first off, I guess what is there any program that's being used in the in the VLA uh, or or what's the math approach that they're taking? Because I uh, read it's the same it's the same approach that the South Royalton Elementary campus is using. I okay. actually can weigh in though real quickly. I think that might be transitioning because Deb Ma uh, Deb Matthews. Deb Scott does have training in iReady, and so I don't know if she's going to stick with that or move into, no, she has a training in Vision, rather, so she might be transitioning to Envision just because she has background in that. She also, though, is has her master's in, and went to the Vermont Math Institute for Teachers, so she has she has the background. She doesn't actually need a program, but. It's why we hired Deb, is that, I, like, we need a math teacher. And, you know, I think one of the things you'll see us do is pilot this idea of trying to really find out what folks' expertise is if they start to continue to allow teachers to experiment with that around whether or not they want to be teaming and specializing. And Bethel does some of that already, I believe. And I know this is just, you know, one data point and stuff, but, you know, how do we feel about you know the scores and you know and where we're at i mean i don't know i mean to me you know 19 percent efficiency or proficiency uh in five through eight is pretty scary uh you know where you know it's coming from the background that i have you know I'm, i might be a little opinionated on it but uh uh you know i would definitely you know i think you know what what are the goals i mean where where should we be uh and and I guess, you know, I think you all are implementing the plan to get there, but, you know, do we feel, you know, like we have everything we need to, to make our way there? I think that, um, somebody else talking? Well, I'll just jump in. I mean, the, the yeah. goal would be 80 to 85% meeting the benchmark. That's what all the research says. You know that you, you're really implementing at full steam ahead universally if you're at 80 to 85%. Um, and so that would be the goal. And, uh, you know, I'll let the principals talk about are we there. No, I mean, I, when you look at math, Chris, there hasn't been a lot of energy spent in math. Yeah. We're all in a map across the SU and math. So. Yeah. Well, and I, and I don't think it's just an SU thing, too, though, either. I mean, I think it's the whole state. Uh, so I, I have an opinion about this, too. And I'll tell you a couple things. If we did a poll of where you, you would land, if we were like, so what's Chris going to see right away? This is what you would see right away. And I don't think anybody else wouldn't see it, Chris, because it's such a, a dramatic number. So I want to talk about it a little bit. We had a faculty meeting today like we do every faculty meeting, and we updated them that we were going to present tonight, and this was going to be presented. One of the math teachers had to leave in tears. And she blames herself, right? And that's what teachers do. And that's not what any of us want. And she'll be fine. And she'll like put herself back together. And it's not her fault. And I joked and I was like, it's the fifth grade teacher's fault. It's a joke. But the point that I head towards with that is vertical understanding. We need to have a pre-K through 12 common language and common approach. And I think Bob was saying this. It doesn't mean you need to lockstep all the way along. You need to like, oh, it's Tuesday, you know, October 20th. We're doing this project because that's the day it is. And also, 
Mindy Beth, who's really like stepped immediately into her role as the academic multi-tiered systems of support leader, has met with me, has met with Andra, Reed, Cass, our math interventionist. And right away, we're looking at like, what's going on here? And it's not an anomaly because it was 73% last year. Same grade group. That's a major problem. And I think Jamie's saying the point that I want to make is we haven't focused on math and it's going to bite us. And it's important these kids have math skills because that informs science and art and music and that they love math. And I am, I am going to stand here and I'm going to try to say, you know, we have 81% that are not meeting, being proficient and Jamie's saying they should be 85. We need to turn that around. And I believe that's 180 degrees. It's a math joke. But it's no joke. And um, I think Mindy Beth said it earlier, of like we would like to expand that math literacy uh, person to a full-time position or two half times, whatever it is. And I don't think it has to be middle school. I think it has to be pre-K-12 mindset. There's no excuse. I will stand here as the leader, the instructional leader of the middle school. I'm not going to blame the fifth grade. And I'm not going to blame the teachers. I am the leader. This needs to change. I make my commitment tonight. Mindy Beth, fix this. <laughs> anyway, it is serious to us. Yeah, and I, you know, and I think that you know, I don't, you know, I feel sorry for the teacher that that left in tears, and, and in no way do I hold anybody, you know, responsible. But yeah, I think we need to, like you said you know, find the way forward uh, to on this. So that's my concern. Next I year, I want to bring you good news on this specific. Also, I'm just going to weigh in and say that I think we are working together in a way we haven't before. And it's it's just going to take some time to change that culture and also show that we, we value these. I mean, I just want to be really real about what a middle schooler taking an online test looks like. It's not their favorite thing to do. They don't think it's really cool. <laughs> so to shift the culture about, about our, what we value, it's just going to take a second to. Um... The other thing I, I've seen this fall, and it is it is exciting time, and I'm going to lay some of that in Jamie, that he's really charged us all up. All the principals are charged up. And I know Reed, Andrew, and I are, that we really believe we want to be an exceptional school that's a niche school that people want their kids in. We want the problem of not having enough room. So the work we're doing this fall at the middle school, I can speak of, the outdoor stuff, this will separate us from everybody. And if you want to see kids loving school, which will turn them into good mathematicians when we present it in a way that's right and th that we can also make sure they're getting what we're measuring. That's, we're looking at all of this. So we're, uh, we're tearing this apart. We're, we're approaching this as a problem to be solved, just like math. How, how often do we do STARS 360 testing? Is it a once a year thing or is it? It's scheduled for three, but you could do it 175. <laughs> we're not going to do that. I'd like to weigh in for another second too and say that when we look at data, and we look at literacy, we have two assessments. We have a computerized independent assessment. And we have another assessment where the teacher is sitting with a student, having a conversation about something that they're reading. And you're gaining very different information from those two things. When it comes to math, we only have this computerized assessment. Um, and I think that moving, if we were to move in the direction of having a math team, having a second assessment to back that up, is going to give us more information about the students so that we can better help them. Um, and I know that I've asked the middle school interventionists to start looking into some paper pencil assessments that the kids can do. Um, when we do literacy and we compare that teacher reading with the student to their star 360, um, oftentimes we do see that they match. And that, that makes us feel really good about ourselves because we know that the kids were confident when they took both of those tests. And there's nothing for us to compare math to. Um, so I think that having maybe some other assessment three times a year um, would really help give a well-rounded diagnostic assessment of all of our students. 
Hi, this is Tammy. I'm just public person or comment um, question on that. So the middle schoolers and the high schoolers that are taking these assessments, um, I, I not it might be written in your documentation, but the environment that they're taking them in, considering we just transitioned from two days to four, plays a major role. Um, so when I hear my middle schooler say, somebody was yelling out the window from lunch while I was having my outdoor test, um, is a distraction. And so um, I don't want to you know, put everything in that bucket and say that that might have contributed, but I, I don't think it positively contributed if that's the case. And so I have to recognize that transition that we just incurred. And so some of these students might have been taking this test at home from what you've described for computer simulation. Is that right? Yeah. OK. There's a lot to it. But you know, the, the thing that really does bother me, we know, we, we know this about the math. And we can also, we know a lot. But we also need a good plan forward. And we haven't had time and inclination to do that. I feel like having Mindy Beth leading us with this has really already been so helpful. I think we've been in school 29 days. And having her leading us on this and having Jamie setting really clear goals and like, these are big goals. This is, and there's no, no chump change on the table here. We're gonna, we're gonna work hard. And we are working on it, but we're excited about it too. We feel really good about it. I'm embarrassed for us tonight. And I want to take that on because I haven't suffered enough this week. And it's Tuesday. Um, do we do much to try and connect um, students who are struggling with, you know, community resources like tutors and things like that who might be able to help them? outside of things that we can do kind of through the budget you know more interventionist would be nice but you know it might be good to leverage some you know community members who might be able to help i think we can bring a plan back to you with more detail we can, we know what to do but well, i'm not saying what you're saying is wrong or anything but we'll draw on like the uvm experts and castleton experts and and we're going to get this but thank you that's a good suggestion Definitely mentors and math mentors specifically, or math exposing kids to uh, careers that have math embedded in them. So, yeah, Chris, I, I, you're going to have about 18 uh, kids at your house starting um, next Monday. Andrew, I mean, I find that, you know, I've had luck in the past by utilizing after school programming to bring tutors in because you have the students there. And I think there's ways for us to leverage more intervention and support through One Planet in general across mm -hmm. PSU. And so that's something that I'm interested in talking to Bill and Carrie about in the principals, uh, because I've had issues in the past where I've set up students and when they don't show up because they're relying on family vehicle travel and stuff that I've burnt people out, they've gotten frustrated, like I'm here to help. But if they're coming actually to the school to support the student, mm -hmm. I've had much better success because the students there. I think that's one way for us to navigate that. And, you know, one of the things I think we need to do is, is make certain that we have a focused approach to what math intervention looks like. There's a lot of reading interventions out there. There's not a lot of math interventions or approaches out there. So one of the things we need to do here between now and next year when we look to implement more math intervention is have a common approach to how we provide it. Um, just be this on the data side of things, I'd be Sorry, what, Jamie? It, it can't just be more rote practice. Do you know what I mean? Like, it really needs to be based on some milestones and sequential, uh, the linear approach to math instruction. And so, you know, I think we need to, there's some diagnostic work that can, that I know that training that's done through the higher ed collaborative. And I'd be interested as we tap folks to be math interventionists, even if they do reading too, that we put them through that because uh, there is a sequential approach around the diagnostic to see where the gap is. And then, you know, make certain we start to focus right there where the breakdown is. And you don't move forward until you fill that gap. Because it's about, you know, it's about eventually over time as you fill gaps, catching the kid up, not just trying to keep them up. Intervention should not be practice of what they're learning in universal instruction.
on the data report side of things, I mean, it's good to see who's what percentage of our kids are proficient and not proficient. Is it possible to come up with a report that would use just students that have been in the system for multiple reports so that we can see how our instruction is doing? Because, you know, like, especially with kids dropping out for the, because we're not including the virtual academy data. And if you have kids moving in and out of the district, you know, that can make it harder to interpret the data. Um, if we were just looking at kids who took the test and then took it again, so we can see how those kids are doing. And I, I don't know if it could be, you know, it'd be kind of nice to have it more than just proficient, not proficient, you know, like, are we seeing improvement with the kids that we're teaching or are we seeing, you know, like what percentage of kids are going up and how many kids are, are stagnating or going down or whatever. In your district, we can show you scale scores by cohort grades. Mm -hmm. This report was put together uh, by um, Mariana because there's certain districts I can't show that because they're so small, the students are identifiable. So I think with you, we can use the STAR 360 reports to show you scale growth for each grade level and cohort. And to me, the scale score is way more important than the number of proficient. So I'd like to add to that, Jamie. So when we're talking about the two, our two schools, we have many more reports that are broken down to be grade level specific. Um, and we even have reports that are very student specific. You know, I can take a child in fifth grade and I can look back five years and see their growth or their regression on that particular student. Um, and something else that we're gonna do this year um, as part of our CIP work is we're gonna um, focus in on free and reduced lunch kids and look at what their growth is because uh, of our equity goal. So I think there's multiple ways to tackle data and yes, it can go from this big picture that you were seeing, that you saw tonight, right down to those individual classrooms and those individual so that work is definitely happening. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think in, in general, it'd be good to see a report that kind of like this is a good, how are we doing, but it doesn't really give you like a great view of how if we're getting individual kids. So if we could get a report that kind of captures that a little bit, I'd, I'd like that for the yeah. future. I think one of the things I'm appreciating about this report right now is that it's been, I think a few years since we went and looked at the data wall and we got sort of a whole picture of where our students were at. Um, so even though this is really big picture and it doesn't show us uh, it only shows the two-year comparison. Um, I do appreciate that we have every grade level, even though the virtual kids aren't in there right now, I understand why. Um, so I do appreciate that we have this report and that we have data to talk about. So thank you for that. Any other questions while we have, um, well, while we have this data to look at and we have Mindy Beth here and Andra, Owen, and Reed. I'd like to, has any one of the principals, have you gone to like your sixth grade teacher and said, how are your math kids doing? What are the shortcomings? What don't they know? What do they know? Have you ever just done that? I don't, I'm not going to talk to the fifth grade teachers. <laughs> I, feel like I think you're, that. I can generalize that though, Bob. Sure. We have talked, we talk about math with them, but I think it's another great idea. We don't have a systemic approach and we have to, and that's the piece that we're going to create. And that those questions will be in there. I think it's qualitative and quantitative information we want. And I think as much as it's important for us to talk with the math teachers, I think it's important for the math teachers to talk vertically with each other. Yeah. And so I, I feel like 
as elementary teachers, we've just started talking across campuses a lot more than we ever used to, and it's great. And I think they're learning from each other and growing. But I, I think like sometimes uh, we don't walk down the hall. We definitely don't walk down the hall right now because of COVID, but we aren't having enough conversations between the upper elementary teachers and the middle school teachers. And mm -hmm. I, I'm quite certain we're definitely not having those conversations, maybe middle school teachers to high school teachers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the room where we're moving towards is, is improving those conversations. Well, Bob, I, mean, too, I mean, I can, and then re, whoever's next can jump in, but I expect my principals, and that's the part of why we're doing this MTSS training, is that they need to know their data and they need to know whether or not students are growing and what co cohorts they're not growing. Mm -hmm. And then there's part of being an instructional leader is sitting down and digging into the data with the teachers and saying, what do we need to do different about universal instruction? I mean, I think that's the difference between part of being an instructional leader is that, and it's those conversations. Um, and so, you know, I think that as we become better at the frameworks to have those conversations and the understanding of how do we prioritize our time to have those conversations, I think the better we'll get at it. I don't know if that answers your question too. I think that they do it now, but I think as a system, we haven't necessarily said, here are the non-negotiables around that. Well, I'm sure Reed, your math teacher is at the ninth grade level say to you, if you talk to them, that kids coming into ninth grade math don't have whatever skills that they need to hit ninth grade math. You know, if that's happening, then like I as a principal would go, go talk to the principal below me to find out what's going on. And I personally don't like program math. And, uh, you know, I have another way of approaching it. But if that's what we got, and that's what we're doing, then we better figure out how to make the best of it. One of the nuances with the high school is that we're actually pulling kids from a bunch of different middle schools. So it's not just coordinating with what's happening in Bethel, but we, we probably need to disaggregate the data and look at what's, what's coming to us from other middle schools that feed into us, um, and then look at a larger SU math program uh, and how is that playing out in the high school numbers. Um, you know, it, for lack of having that kind of information at the moment, our focus is going to be on what can we do to support the kids we have with the skills where they're at right now. Uh, and Mindy Beth is meeting with, with uh, Jamie, myself, and uh, my ninth and 10th grade math teachers and English teachers tomorrow morning. And we're going to talk about the sorts of inter intervention we can provide to students now this year to help get those numbers up. Thank you. Yep. So we're switching from scorecard based things to proficiency based. Um, I imagine that might help. Yeah, Andrew, that is, that's part of the goal, right? If we're if we're all reporting out on common benchmarks and proficiencies across the SU at each grade level, then you got to teach to those, right? And so that's that's part of the power around us becoming a truly proficiency based system is that we'll have clear benchmarks for each grade level. And how you get to that end could look different, right? There can be some differentiation there, building to building. But the idea is that all students are going to know, understand, and be able to do the same things grade level to grade level. And right now, we're not reporting out that way. And therefore, that doesn't necessarily reinforce teaching that way. And so I, I think it's really important that at the elementary that we're keep communicating out on what we want students to know, understand, and do, because then there's accountability to ensure that we're actually teaching that when you go to assess it. All right, thank you. Um, I think that that provides us a segue to our 21-22 um, student support budget which we touched on a little bit in the in the 
in the business manager's report. Um, and this was something that was emailed to us, I think this afternoon. So if you're looking for it in your email, that's a good place to reference it. And uh, the um, finance committee got this on Thursday, just so you, everyone knows. Um, and so I'll just set the context and give you some big picture stuff. And then the principal can ask specific questions. <laughs> You can ask specific questions of the principals. Um, the one of the things we're trying to do across the SU is part of why we restructure at the SU is to look at how do we free up some title funds that we're paying for positions at the SU, and how can we use that money to then trickle back down into the local districts to offset some interventions and supports. Okay, and so I want to highlight some areas that we're looking to fund through the CFG. The, the federal grant is the idea of adding a pathways coordinator that's down there at the toward the bottom it's the last section you don't currently have a pathways coordinator you have a community-based learning coordinator and part of what we talked about is we're starting to pilot some pathways now and you may say well what are pathways well the idea is that this person would act as a facilitator of learning they'd have students throughout the day and that 60 percent of their job would be to service all students and how do they service them? Well, it would be really leveraging a personalized learning plan to create passion projects that align up to proficiencies that then could be awarded for credits. It's to assist students who want to take virtual courses and that they have a place to land and have a teacher to facilitate and support them with that work. Um, it is a student comes in and says, you know, I really like large animals. That's my passion. And Mary Waterman sets them up with a farm, per se, for community-based learning. Well, we still need someone to say, that's great that you're working at the farm, but how are you going to demonstrate proficiencies in biology and English language arts, right? Because you need credits in those two areas. So we got to create a product that demonstrates achievement of those proficiencies that links to your passion. And so that's what this person would be doing. So it gives another pathway that looks different that's not the traditional factory model setting to go through high school. Part of the idea is, is we have students start to learn that they can learn based on personalized learning. My sense is, is that we will have students that start to say, oh, I didn't know I could learn that way. I didn't know I could earn proficiency that way. You're gonna, I believe you're gonna have juniors and seniors that currently right now say the, that they wanna learn through experiential learning and earn content area credit. And the only way for them to do that is through the tech center decided that maybe they didn't want to go to the tech center. They didn't necessarily have a passion, but that was the only way they were going to learn that way. The other point for this is going to be for dropout prevention. Students who are totally disengaged, disenfranchised, school didn't work for them, and that they're looking at dropping out. And so 40% of this person's position would be to target those students, to wrap around them, and to help facilitate really outside the box plans that gets them through high school and supports them toward their path of graduation. Now, sometimes that takes five years, but that's okay. That's part of proficiency-based learning too. Um, and so that's a new position. And so 60%, that 45,000 would be funded locally. The other 40% other would be funded through Title II. All right, so I just wanted to highlight that. MTSSA, uh, Mary Beth Pike, as you just saw, sorry, uh, Pathways would be funded through Title IV. I apologize. Uh, MTSSA, you're looking at Mary Beth right now is completely local. Uh, due to the role and the work that she does, we can get um, a big chunk of her salary, about 50000 we have tentatively budgeted in Title II. So that's fine. Yeah, Mindy Beth, you're on the call. You still get a paycheck, don't worry. No, no, no. Mindy Beth, not Mary Beth. Oh, I, said, I thought I said Mindy Beth. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, so that's part of how that will be funded, which offsets, of course, local re revenue. And this is important because it's going to decrease your per pupil spending, which aligns directly back to your tax rate. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's why we're trying to use these grant funds. 
Regular Ed Perez, I'm not at a point right now to talk to you about what exactly those positions are, but we are looking to do some reductions in regular education Perez um, that currently support through regular ed. The um, nurse, you can see that that's down. That's just based on personnel decisions as far as whether or not um, health insurance is being taken. Uh, guidance office, that is down. One of the things that we're looking at um, between the principal's office and admin, and these are all their budget line codes, by the way, within each one of those areas. It's not just their salary and benefits. It's also all their budget lines, okay, that we're, are within the principal's office, is that we would go from five currently right now um, secretaries and supports across the two campuses of the schools down to four. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need all the roles and responsibilities currently covered. Covered. What I've said to the principals is, is that you have four FTE. We're also looking to make those four, they're budgeted for as year-round. I think it's important that schools stay open in the summer, especially as you guys look to collect tuition students. I don't think it's okay for your high school not to have someone there throughout the summer months. And so we look to align um, vacation time to ensure that your high school stays open in the summer months. Um, because again, we're looking at how do we market ourselves and recruit students. And part of that is ensuring that we have a friendly face there to greet them and talk about the high quality programming we have. And so if you look, part of why that guidance is down, it's not removal of a guidance council or anything. I know what folks think in that. It's just putting all the secretarial staff up actually up and the principal slash admin line, which you see is up. And there were some changes in health insurance coverage. And principals can jump in with anything else I missed and then you guys can ask any question you'd like. And this is a first glance to get feedback. This is not, this is not a final draft by any means. It's to get feedback from the board. This, will, this part of the budget will come back to you again in November along with the rest of your personnel that provide universal instruction for all students. Mm -hmm. So in November, you'll get this in addition to another huge chunk. Principals, did I miss anything? I, I just add that uh, embedded in the pathways position is that that's someone who would support, uh, yeah. heavily support students in the alternative high school program. Um, but there will be additional staffing needed to run that program. Uh, we, we believe we have the academic staff within our budget to have you know an English teacher for a period and a social studies teacher for a period to help support that. Um, so where we, we might have proposed a budget cut to a position for a period or two last year. We probably won't do that this year, um, looking at supporting the alternative program. And there would be some special education staffing changes uh, where resources within the, within the SU might be reallocated in recognition that we're, we're keeping more special ed students uh, from alternative programs by keeping them in-house. Mm -hmm. But because that's special ed money, it's not part of the Rudd story here, but it, it's part of what's no, that's a good addition. So if a teacher is helping with the special education program, would some of their salary come from special education or would it? it no, it can't because they're not special ed licensed. But Andrew, I think what Don's going to tell you is those students will actually be Rudd students. Right. But they're going to be your students, even though they access the alternative high school. So there will be money that follows from the district they're transferring in from. So, I just say, so for example, we send uh, a couple students uh, up to Randolph uh, to a program there at a cost of about thirty thousand dollars a year. Uh, by and that's special education money. We're not paying that out of our local budget. Um, that special education dollars, but if those special education dollars aren't being spent that way, then then that's extra resources for an alternative program within our building in South Royalton. 
of course, you guys get billed the highest chunk on those special ed costs. Right. I'd like to comment on the alternative school. I've had an I've had an experience where I ran an alternative school as part of my uh, high school at Fairhaven, and we served all kids, special ed and regular education kids. But every kid that went to that alternative school had a personal learning plan, and. They might be there for a half day, they might be there for a whole day, they might be in a class at the high school for, for one part of the day, and they would be in the alternative school for another part of the day. Um, I ran it with one teacher, a special education teacher, and a parent. And we serviced about 20 kids. And it was a real successful program. It took care of those kids that are regular education kids that did not like school. School is not for them, but they could go, they could they could take a half day of classes and then go to work in the afternoon. It was a, um, it was a, a blessing for so many kids. So I think it's a really good idea. I think it will solve a lot of discipline problems because I I noticed that right away. And also, you'll find that these kids will get a, a really good education and like it. So I I think it's a I think it's a good thing. And a lot of special ed kids, um, what they need is personal attention and help getting their classes done. And, and I think it can be done in an alternative school. And then you have regular edu education kids that want to drop out of school or don't want to go to school. But what you'll find is that they will enjoy going, knowing that they, part of the day, they're going to be able to leave and go do something. Different. So I think Jamie's got a great idea. and. Uh, he might not put it together the same way I did, but I think it's um, it's a good plan. Yeah, I agree. Um, so thank you, and I look forward to hearing more about this. Any other questions about the student support budget? I have a question, and I asked Reed this, um at the finance committee meeting and uh reed did you have any uh any comments to make about the intervention interventionists uh i was going to defer to owen and andra who were were prepped that that question may come out tonight so uh if if they want to talk about how the interventionists are being used 3k8 uh, that i think will answer your question I want to know how they're supervised. I want to know what their day looks like. And I want to know what they do. Are you going to start, Andra? You're muted. I think you're muted, Andra. <clears throat> you're muted again. <laughs> what the heck are you doing? <laughs> I you're giving Andrew a big chunk. Well, Andrew, I can buy a little time. Part, they're supervised by the principals. Yeah, I can That's do it, Jamie, if you want. I implemented this year, Bob, because I had the same question, is, is that we're doing two-week time studies on everyone. Um, because that was mostly to ensure, you know, what percentage of our interventionists was spent providing explicit intervention um, throughout their day. And what do I mean by that? I think it's really important that we monitor does our schedule support intervention is providing intervention throughout the day? Or are there chunks of time where the schedule doesn't allow for it? And that's sometimes where intervention is you don't get your full 1.0, it's because the schedule doesn't allow for a full 1.0. Mm -hmm. And so every intervention is throughout the, well, the principals had to turn in intervention and schedules to me as well as they do, so that we could start to analyze those together. Mm -hmm. And to also just kind of highlight 
you know, is our schedule supporting high quality intervention throughout the day? And then two, I'm collecting bi-weekly time studies right now. Mm -hmm. Part of that is required by the grant, but part of it too is to analyze not more so what FTEs do we need. Also in addition, I think does the schedule support? You know, I think there's times we have interventionists that aren't providing explicit intervention because everyone's at essentials at that time. You know what I mean? And so you got to line up the schedule throughout the grades to ensure that you can keep people providing intervention throughout the entire day. The other thing That's that they- That's what I'm after in regards to collecting that data. A few other things they do, um, they can give a kid an assessment one-on-one. -on -one. So they test them in a, they control the setting and they can test them in a way that they can watch them and also know that they're getting, like the question doesn't give them the answer, but, and they coordinate completely with the teachers. So part of it also has become like evangelizing and that it would be, um, so they will teach teachers some of the best intervention um, methods. They are supervised. I supervise the two middle school ones, and Andra would be the supervisor for all the rest because they're all the remainder ones are in the elementary on both campuses. Right now, we are proposing, a, I think, a total of five interventionists, and two of those are half time. And only half of that will be, we're proposing as math. But I think I saw in there the second half of that for high school math. Reed, is that true? Not yeah. right now. Un it says budget assumptions underneath the um, document that we were just reviewing. And it says, Reed, uh, Ray, can you put that up again one more time? The, um, hold on. I don't have it, no. All right. So anyway, it was, um, there it is. So if you look down at the bottom there, it says budget assumptions, 50% math intervention for high school to be added with grant funding. So we, Reed will be supervising that person if that comes to be. What's the matter, Andra? You can't join us? I think it's a sign from, you know, Google got in trouble today, by the way. Can you unmute? She can't for some reason. Um, Bob, do you want more than that, or I mean? Well, I don't understand. Um, do you have a, a, a resource room for all students in your school? Okay. Okay. That's do, helpful. Do you? Do you have one? We have a classroom. Uh, it's a classroom that's being used as a center for the focus is literacy. Yeah, but it could be also math. It could, of course, could of course. Actually, we have a different setting for the math group that we set up um, just because we brought the kids inside. At, and we only are doing that direct math intervention at the middle school. I can speak about Andrew can speak about it at well, the elementary. Let me, ask this question. Much. let me ask this question. If you have a student that needs extra help, can they go to a resource room and get it? That's not how we do it. We no, schedule we it so that we can provide explicit instruction. Yeah. I mean, I think my goal is is that we move to any interventions four days a week, minimum yeah. of thirty minutes, research based, and that it's focused on whatever the gap is. And if we're effective, and part of what I'm looking to start measuring is is rate of growth for the students who receive intervention. If students are living in intervention, that's a problem. It means it's not effective. Students should need intervention forever. If it's right. Like, so that's know, a tier effective, what people call a the period of time, you should close the gap. And let's say you have a true learning disability. Well, we know most, it's only about 5% of your students, by the way, that have a true specific learning disability, three to five. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are just struggling to grasp universal instruction. So that's why I keep saying, like, if we get our universal instruction stronger, you're going to see the need of intervention to go down. 
and you're going to find it says 75 75 students in reading you might only have 30. right now we have too many students in intervention and part of that is is that our, we need to strengthen our universal instruction and that's not that teachers aren't working hard they are but like you heard tonight we didn't have common approaches you're only on the second second year of your literacy program we we have some students that are casualties of instruction Right. I agree. I agree with you, Jamie, that we need to think in more of a mindset of that students will graduate out of um, intervention. That it's a temporary spot. It's a like a pit stop in, on a racetrack. And we do that right, right now at the elementary level with um, PBIS, that model of like a student that they're only in there for eight weeks. They're only getting that direct intensive support for eight weeks and they graduate. And it's monitored and checked, and and it's really, um, as you were saying earlier, Bob, it's very personalized for that student, but based in the best instruction. I like Jamie's structure of four times a week, thirty minutes, and then you have to ask yourself the question of like, why is this kid still here? Either we're not doing it right, or this is the three percent kid. But we haven't implemented with fidelity necessarily, right? Like we say, ah, they're going to get math twice a week. Right. And it may not be a common approach. Well, you're not going to close gaps that way. You got to implement with fidelity. And that's, that's part of what we're trying to work on. It's part of why I'm, you know, looking at schedules. It's part of why we're doing the MTSS work. At the SU level, we don't have an agreed upon approach right now what defines intervention. I like it. And so we need to define that. And it really should be explicit, it should be research-based, and it should be focused on gap filling on that student and not just generalized or just extra help or support. Because we don't want the student to have to need extra help and support forever. Mm -hmm. We're spending a lot of money on interventionists. You know, and I guess I want to see results and I, I mm -hmm. I want to see this. I want to see the students getting the support they need and, and improving um, in the support that they're getting. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I if I were a principal, I'd want to know what they were doing every single minute. And then if I had a student who needed some help, I'd be getting them there. Well, so we think, have we have their schedules. Okay. So you're satisfied as a principal that your that your uh, interventionists are doing are busy all day long and they're providing support for those students that need it, and you're seeing improvement because of it. Well, I think you can go right back to earlier when I said I'm not happy. So what are you going to do to improve it? I guess. Yeah, and we were talking about that earlier, and I think part of it is is we did not have a model that Jamie explains of four times a week, 30 minutes. We don't have a systemic approach. We have people working really hard. I don't want people just working hard. I want people working hard with results. We're spending $285,000 to get that. And I, I guess I'm in favor of it if we're, if we're getting results. Those are for the interview. I don't have the document in front of me. I, I think what's exciting for me about what I'm hearing related to intervention, I mean, I agree with you, Bob, that there needs to be oversight and accountability. Um, but having a cohesive program and having one principal looking at both elementary schools and making sure that students are getting what they need with fidelity and that we're implementing a consistent structured approach as well as universal supports in all our classrooms and making sure our teachers have the training to work with the interventionists um, is exciting for me because I don't think we've had that, particularly in the area of math. I mean, we've been being told, and to some degree I believe it's true, that when students become more literate and when their literacy skills become stronger then they become better math students. Um, and I know that that's true because when you read better, many other doors open up to you.
but I think that this data um, shows us we really do need to focus more on math. And so I'm glad to hear that we're doing that and that our principals are taking those goals seriously. And, you know, rounding numbers, uh, let's say we have a $12 million budget. I think 2% of that is 260,000, right? Or whatever. I might have that part wrong. So there's no, none of it's uh, frivolous to me by any stretch, but 2% of our budget is right now, and that's a rough number, for intervention. And I agree, every penny should be spent right. I also agree with Jamie on like, it's first instruction that matters. We have to do better in first instruction. Andrew, do you want to just talk about your approach to intervention? I said that, you know, one of the things I'm after is a common approach across the SU that intervention needs to happen four times a week, minimum 30 minutes a day, and it needs to be research-based. Are we getting closer to that now that we're back full days? Yeah, absolutely. I will say that we started the, the school year using our interventionists as buddy, as buddy teachers. Um, so we definitely weren't launching into, into, into intervention. We went slow. Um, but we did put our interventionists in those classes that had the highest need so that there could be that That's double. That's really COVID, just to be clear. That's exactly why. Um, but yeah, I would say we have the new schedules for interventionists and based on this new data from the the STAR testing and the founders of Pinnell, we reassess who needs um, push in small group who needs pull out. I mean, it's, it's some of it's case specific depending on the kiddo, right? Some kids need really a more one-on-one -on -one approach just because of attention and or, or how deficit they are. So it, it really, what their schedules look like is they're all over the place depending on the interventionist and we reassess it um, multiple times throughout the year. And yeah, I think we are moving to, towards trying to just do that really heavy, quick six week intervention to move a kid. Um, and and I'm, I think we'll be able to report out more gains in December um, based on what we're doing right now. Okay. Um, is everyone okay with moving forward to the Visbit safety audits? All right, thank you for bringing us that student support budget. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you, you, that was just a draft for early discussion, correct? That's correct, yep. Nope, so just, I mean, well, I would, it sounds like to me that there's nothing in there right now that you want necessarily change before next month. That's not what I'm hearing. I think it was a good conversation about priorities. Uh, and it seems like there's a lot of common ground in terms of being focused on um, student needs and student success. So I put the Visbit audit on here because they have been requested. This is before my time. Um, and so the principals and I kind of talked some today about maybe what audit necessarily you guys were interested in discussing. It could have been the overall audit from last yeah, fall. This, this was regarding when Visbit came out and did your building and your playground inspections, and then we were supposed to work to address the high priority items. And then we had the secondary security audit that showed your weaknesses in the security of the schools, if there were any. So, I mean, what I would like to, the front, the, I talked to Owen today, the facility committee has not gone up and really got running. I think this is a good launch point. And so I was thinking that that, that committee could take these audits and dig into them. The other thing that we have is Lyle Smith has been doing some work for me at Rochester and I'm going to be bringing him in in kind of like a consulting role for facilities and maintenance across the SU. So he's going to give us about two days a month um, at a very reasonable rate. And he, he is currently the facilities director of all the elementary schools in the Champlain Valley Supervisory Union, that, that district, CVU. 
So he has a great deal of experience. He also worked at Visbit. And he's looking to start to transition from full-time to part-time and do some, some consulting work. I don't think we need a full SU um, head of maintenance and facilities, but I think we need someone who's an expert on these types of things. And so what I said to the principals and said to Owen is, it seems like this is a good launch point for him to come in and to start to support us in this work and look at how do we build a strategic plan around preventative maintenance that hopefully saves money in the, in the near future. And December will be your maintenance and facilities budget and he's gonna help us with that because none of us are pros in maintenance and facilities. But I think there's a lot of efficiencies that could be found potentially if we're looking across the SU at bulk buying and things of that nature. And so he's gonna assist me with doing some of that work. And so I would look to, if you guys want as a board to maybe have that committee dig into this and then come back to you guys in December when you're looking at that part of a budget with a more full report. Does that sound all right? Or how do you guys, how do you feel about that? And Lyle- I think you, that's yeah. a great way to proceed. Thank you. And Chris, you're on that committee with me, right? All right, you got your marching orders, Owen. And Owen, I'll give you the contact inf info for Lyle because he can just join you virtually. Okay, I think Owen dropped for a minute, so he missed. Owen, you get your marching yeah. orders and I will give you Lyle's contact and connect you so that okay. he can join you to start okay. digging into that. And like I said, he worked at Visbit, so the these are not foreign reports to him. So uh, my marching orders, I did drop out for a minute there. Um, so you're going to give me Lyle's contact, and I'm going to set up a meeting. I think, yeah, you should get the finance, uh, the the facilities, facilities committee? committee started on this. And who was the second person with Chris? There were two I board members. It was Lisa. McCormick. Lisa. Yeah, it was me. Okay, we're on it. Look at that memory right there. Yeah, got some synapses. I'll tell you, that's why you can't get away with anything. They think I forget. I don't. <laughs> okay, um, next is the snowplow bid review, which I believe the finance committee looked at. Right. Bob, um, you want to tell us what you found out from the town? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my, re my fear. Um, so I suggested that we go to the towns and ask them to plow out the school parking lots because to me, there's a lot of money involved in plowing. And in my past, the town has plowed the, plowed the parking lot in uh, South Royalton, and they used to plow the parking lot in Bethel. So I've talked to the town manager at Bethel, and I've talked to two select board members in Royalton. And I've also talked to the road foreman in Royalton. So, there's a real, there's a reluctance on the part of the road foreman to do to do the plow. Um, I'm not sure how the select board feel. I think they they partially understood that it's one dollar coming out of the same people. Um, so I would ask Jamie to write a letter to each board. Um, asking them to plow our parking lots. I'm not sure they're going to get a favorable response. Um, I think we should somehow act on the plowing bid, and I don't know how we do it, but uh, I think the select boards meet next week. And I, I will tell you that I think that the road foremen are both going to, you know, say they don't want to do it. And um, I don't know if the select men, you know, will make them do it or not. So that's where, that's where I'm seeing it. It's, it's kind of like up in the air. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. 
Yeah, when I was a selectman, I told the rural company he's going to do it. So, but you know, it's it's sixty thousand dollars of taxpayer money, and the tax and the taxpayer. I mean, the towns have the equipment to do it with. The Royalton one would be a little more difficult, but I think we could work it out because of the entrance into the school um, as a uh, divider down through the middle. And we might have to do something a little bit different, but Royalton has a tractor and a snowblower too. So they have the ability to do what needs to be done. Whether they do it or not, I don't know. But I, I would suggest that Jamie uh, write a letter to each board asking them to plow, asking if they, they would plow the parking lots. And the same point, I think, if you need to act on a, um, a bid, that we act on a bid tonight and uh, make it contingent on the selectmen not, not voting to plow. That's my suggestion. So you could do that. Did you, as a committee, did you guys have a recommendation of who? Yes, we did. The finance committee looked at the bid, so I didn't know if the finance committee had a recommendation for the full board. Andrew? Um, we had selected which bid we preferred. Um, so there were three bids, one of which was in the 90,000s, which was significantly higher than the other two, so we kind of disregarded that initially. And there was Dylan McCullough and who was the other one? Jacob Mayer. Jacob Mayer. And those, uh, I think Dylan was a couple hundred dollars cheaper, but um, Jacob Mayer provided a lot more detail about what would be covered in the bid and like exactly when the area would be plowed and what would be done. So. You know, I thought, I think we thought that we preferred that bid. The, uh, and the only other significant difference between the bids is, is that uh, Jacob had an earlier end date to his contract after which we would pay on a per plow basis. Uh, and I talked with him and he would be agreeable to a contract that extended it out to May 15th. So we wouldn't be on the hook for any additional plowing in April. So the this this I think the staff, uh, as well as the finance committee, were in favor of uh, wanting to go with the bid from from Jacob Mayer. So I would entertain a motion um, that we accept that bid contingent upon the select board's refusal to um, have the town road crews plow. Um, and then we can have discussion after the motion's made if we so choose. I'll, I'll, make, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll make that motion. Okay, great. Thank you, Bob. And a second? Uh, this is Lisa. I'll second. All right. Thank you. Is there any discussion about the bid for snow plowing? Um, Lisa, I'd like to I'd like to abstain from this bid because uh, Dylan McCullough plowed my driveway, and okay. he's my neighbor, and uh, right. quite well. And so I would like to abstain from the voting. Okay, thank you. Understood. All right, any other discussion? Because we've used Dylan for the last couple of years, correct? Last year, yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, and you said that um, the maintenance crews or the staff supports this decision to make a transition. Okay. You know, one, one, one consideration, uh, that we talked about in the finance committee is that our our building budgets are built around uh, outsourcing this work 
-hmm. So we, we don't necessarily have the staff in house uh, to plow or shovel uh, our sidewalks, uh, which includes making sure all the fire exit doors and the backs of the buildings are also cleared out. Um, so we, we typically rely on the heavy equipment that the contractor brings in to just do a big sweep, uh, which makes it really easy for them. For us, we don't have a skid steer. Uh, right. so we would have to go out and buy a pretty expensive snowblower in the first year uh, and hire up whether those are temp workers or not to uh, to make sure that our, our sidewalks are plowed. And that's a significant part of the work on both buildings is all of the extra clearing that has to be done on the, the big sidewalks. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Are we, so were we confident that if we do have the towns do it, the towns will be able to take care of it? Do we just discuss it? Oh, well, I mean, we'll have that money in the budget that we weren't spending on a contractor, so we shouldn't have any problem uh, funding it. it. You know, it'll be a little more logistically challenging because uh, we'll have to ramp up pretty quickly and, and get some new equipment to do that. You know, we're not, we're not uh, stockpiling salt right now, for example, to do our sidewalks. So we'd have to come up with a plan for how we're gonna salt our sidewalks and sand them and spread that and that sort of thing. And uh, where we're gonna store that much salt. Uh, we usually just take it from the town, Mr. McCracken. Oh. And we still store it, just saying, that's my experience. <laughs> um, but the bids do include the salt and sand for our parking lot and our walkways. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any further discussion of this, these bids? Okay. All in favor of accepting Jacob Mayer's bid um, pending a negative response from the town select boards um, related to plowing and caring for our school parking lots and driveways, please say aye. 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 Okay, any nays? And we have one ex abstention, um, but the motion carries. Thank you. I guess one last thing is what happens if one town says yes and one town says no? I think I, we need both towns. Just plow yeah. half the parking lot. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I feel like if, if both towns don't agree, then we need to just honor this bid. Okay. Just want to make sure we were explicit. That's just my personal opinion, um, but I think we could make things really more complicated for our administrators and our school staff um, in a year when we don't need any additional complication, frankly. We can always look at doing things differently next year. But, yep, absolutely. So. That could be a, some good leverage if if one agrees and one doesn't. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, toggling back to the agenda here, um, we have our act to approve the snowplow bid, new new hires. This is standing agenda item. Okay, great. Um, any additional public comment? All right, hearing none, I'll move forward. Um, and that brings us to an executive session related to personnel. Yeah, so, so. I just need, I, all I need is the board. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, good night, everyone. Thanks for all your okay. effort. Thank you. So we're entering executive session at 820 and the recording has to stop. I think it it has Is not. Is there a motion? We need to boot the private caller. Um, I'll make a motion to enter we go. executive session. All right. Second. Okay, and we're entering. Yeah, you just have to say no action taken, sorry. Right, no action taken. We leave executive session at 8.33. Rodney, do you want to explain the athletic fields question? Well, it's just a matter of policy. Uh, somebody asked me what the policy is of like independent groups using the field. Uh, basically, I know there's some 
some people that use like softball leagues or whatever during the summer, they use the ball fields and there's some guys that play soccer and, uh, What's the policy on that? Are they allowed to use it? Are they not? Uh... So there's, a community, there's a community use of facilities policy, Rodney, um, that says you fill out the form and then if it doesn't uh, butt up against a school uh, sanction, um, you know, school sanction event that the administration can approve it and there's a minimal fee charge to cover cleanup costs and things of that nature. And so right now I can't open my buildings due to COVID to anyone in the community um other than you guys could have a warm meeting in the evening when students aren't in session that's the only thing that i'm permitted to do as far as outsiders coming in so if we think about basketball and things of that nature for the fields right now we've chosen to keep it to school age student groups across the su and we haven't allowed adult leagues on since school reopened that was covid related it has nothing to do with our school policy so i don't know if this is about a group currently right now that was asking that, but I'd encourage them to talk to Heidi and to Shane, um, our COVID coordinator, and that anything in regards to decisions about limiting access are all COVID related right now. It's nothing to do with us not wanting folks to come in. Um, but I do think my next communication, I need to get in front of it and let folks know I really can't permit any groups into the schools um, at this point in time. Uh, due to actually that that is Department of Health and AOE guidance. Like the only people that can go in that building is actually you on a warm meeting, and it has to be after school hours. Um, otherwise, they have to be school personnel. So we yeah, warn a basketball game for next week. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Rodney? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I understand nobody going in the buildings and, uh, but you know, the outdoor fields, whatever. But um, <clears throat> if that's the policy, then they, basically they have to, have to talk to Heidi and she's will handle it. And sure, I mean, you know. she's good at checking with me about this stuff and her and Shane and I can talk. Um, you know, we were trying to be very cautious to start the year. Um, and our numbers are creeping up all over right now. We just had a huge outbreak in Montpelier due to athletics. Uh, and so, you know, I... I feel really good that we stayed open and knock on wood, I haven't received a call yet. So, you know, my, right now I'm focused on instruction five days a week, um, not on athletics and I'm an athletic guy, but anything I can do to make certain our kids stay in right now, that's my focus. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I just wanted to know what the policy was. That's all. Uh, so if somebody asks, I can answer it, but you know, so sometimes when people ask questions and I don't know the answer, it's like, Oh, one way to find out. Yeah, no, that's great. So that's it. That's all I needed to know. Yeah, and it's good to know that it's COVID related because when I initially heard it, it sounded, it, it made me worry that people who were not asking were using the fields and that people who did ask were, weren't being allowed access. So um, I appreciate knowing that it's related to using those resources for our students and preserving them for our students in this really atypical year. Okay, that's all I that answered my question. So it's... But I do think I need to get in front of it because I do think we're gonna start having more folks ask about men's league for basketball specifically. Mm -hmm. And so I'll try to get information out here in the next week about that bonding. And but we don't even know that's if- That's really a local thing, that's, that's statewide. Mm -hmm. We don't even know if kids will be able to play well, basketball exactly. this year. No, we don't. Right. And due to so. the fact that the numbers are increasing, I think that's less and less likely. Yeah, it's kind of a fishbowl in the gym with basketball. Sorry. All right. Um, any future agenda items? I think budget is the main pressing item um, that's on my mind right now. Other items? I just want to... I'd like to let the board know that um, Jamie's efforts at the at the central office, if if nothing changes, um, he's already saved us one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, toward the towards the seven hundred thousand deficit that we had, and um, I would like. 
this our finance committee to constantly be aware, but I'd like to see us, you know, save at least another another I'd like to see us save three hundred thousand out of this year's budget, but even two hundred thousand or hundred and fifty, it's gonna get us, you know, back to when we go to the taxpayers, um you know they'll they'll know that we've worked hard to try to cut back in the budget and we'll still get um we'll get support for next year's budget so i think jamie's doing his job and i think we need to you know to do ours so and i think the finance committee i find it i, I find it really a good committee i think it's very strong and um a terra's Tara's got a lot of work to do to keep up with it. And, um, but I think that we'll get, we'll get, a, we'll end up with a, with a good surplus this year, I hope. Got that deficit. Thank you. I appreciate those efforts. Mm -hmm. Is it time for a motion to adjourn? I think it might be. Yeah. <laughs> Make a motion to adjourn. All right. Second. All right. All in favor? All right. All right. Good Thanks, night. Uh, I got a sick horse. I got to go check. Oh, mm. good luck. Thank you. Well, How sick? Uh, like 103.5 temp. It's not good in coffin. They've just oh, no. blood panels to Cornell, so I'm a little worried. Yeah. OK. Mm. My biggest well, good luck. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Good night, guys. Night. Good night, everybody.